is the Craig Charles Show, BBC Radio 6 Music. Hold my calls. I can't speak to anyone. I'm about to have a one-to-one with Peter Doherty. Now, Peter, is it Doherty or Doherty? I think that second one was just about perfect. I Doherty. Think you, need, you need to have a Liverpoolian accent to get that. Uh, it's not a vowel, is it? Or whatever it is. It's an H, I suppose. I can't. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. I can't see you. I know. But is, that, is that how you have it? That's not really you. It's, that's not fair. There's no camera on these BBC computers. It's well, not, you just sat there in your kecks with your feet up. That's like, it, mate. Cigar. I'm in my pants yeah. drinking rosé wine here. <laughs> I have to say, it's a pleasure for me to speak to you, man. I grew up with Red Dwarf putting a telly on under the blanket to watch it, man. But, uh, yeah. Thanks so very much, man. I spent a lot of time, I don't mean this to blow smoke, but listen to the Libertines. I, I thought the Libertines were having it. We'll talk about them in a minute because I really want to talk about your collaborative project with composer and producer Frederick Lowe. Tell us yeah, a bit about Mr. Frederick and how, how did you two Frederick get together? Lowe. Yeah, Mr Lowe, he's uh, just appeared one day with a guitar and a hat on his head. He was um, he's sort of quite a well-known-ish French songwriter, composer. And he was just sat there playing his guitar, playing some little riffs. And I said, oh, that's nice. What's that song? I know that song. And he said, oh, no, it's nothing. It's just something I've been working on. And it was uh, such a nice riff. I thought, I need to write some lyrics for that, definitely. So I said, oh, I could I could put some lyrics for that. So he came back a week later and we sat down at the table and tried to put this one song together and then turned into two, turned into three. And then we had a whole record of songs. The album's recorded and it's released quite soon, yeah. And the album's called The Fantasy Life of Poetry and Crime. Yes, it is. The Fantasy Life of Poetry and Crime. How do those two things go together, Peter? I don't know. Well, like, like any fantasy, I suppose you could put it together how you wanted, you know what I mean? I love songs about criminals or crime anyway. I mean, hip-hop is probably the one genre where crime is handled really well and poetically, but I'm not really a big hip-hop fan. I prefer the Towns Van Sant approach, you know, like songs like Pancho and Lefty, Bandits, really, or people from the frontier days mm-hmm. or cowboys. How is your French, um, by the way? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, because you've I'm been a, spending I'm a lot I'm of time a, in the Normandy. I have, but people do tend to talk to me in English, so it's a, it's a slog building up the old vocabulary. Um, my wife's French, and obviously all her family are French. So, doucement. Je prends doucement, mais eventuellement. Slowly, but eventually, huh? Yeah, the accent's good. <laughs> is it fair to say that Frederic Lowe is responsible for your newfound love of France, Normandy? And uh, I read somewhere French cheese as well. No, 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 that's come perfectly naturally to me. You just can't refuse these cheeses. This is the land of cheese, Normandy. You know? mm-hmm. Camembert, Sontevec, Comte. Yeah, just have it in front of you and try saying no. There you go. Yeah, you know? no, no, I can't. But listen, last year you took part in the Pete Darty v. Barlini prison, where prisoners uh, drew right. you while you played the guitar. I mean, yeah, what was it Barlini like prison. doing something like that? Because that sounds it inspired. Nice. It was nice, actually, to keep my clothes on, because when they first said, <laughs> you're going to do a still life at Barlini prison for the still life class, obviously the first thing you think of is a nude model. So I went there with kind of a bit trepidation, thinking, well, I'm not going to be able to say no, I'll just look like I'm bricking it. But they wanted me fully clothed. And uh, so that was, the, that was the first thing. That was a huge relief. They're an amazing bunch of lads like, from right across the board, um, obviously all stuck in Berlini, one reason or another. But at one point, one lad took me aside and said, Pete, like, um, uh, I've been playing guitar a bit since I've been in. I've taught myself how to play, I've written a few songs. and. I said, all right. So I said, go on, give us a few songs then. And he went, no, I'm not doing it in front of the screws and that. I said, no, come on. So he took the guitar and I took the pad and the pencil. We swapped places. And he started bashing out all these uh, lovelorn ballads, like really uplifting, melodic songs. Um, and uh, you should have seen the jaws drop, not just from the other prisoners, but from all the officers. Like, they couldn't believe it. They didn't even know that he could sing or play. He'd just been like teaching himself and like in some back room of the gym, you know, with an old guitar. And you're going to try and get him on the label? I have to, because I promised him I would now, and I don't want to get on his bad side, you know what I mean? He's a a tasty geezer. (laughs) Listen, what were the artwork like? Have you got any on your wall? No, they're out of my price range, actually. They're all (laughs) all bought by big underground figures. We went back a couple of months later to see the exhibition, and some of the families were there. And, uh, yeah, no, it's quite an emotional evening, actually. We put up the lads' paintings, but also excerpts of their own ideas about the day, yeah, there were some interesting interpretations. No, I wanted to get copies of them all. I think I did. Yeah, they're not up on the wall because this is my mother-in-law's place. So as soon as I get my own gaff, yeah. Listen, I want to talk about your love of poetry and your involvement in poetry. But first, can we play that tune? 
Uh, you can't keep it from me forever. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Pete Doherty, and you can't keep it from <laughs> me forever. My guest is Pete. He's joining me from Normandy. You started writing poetry at quite a young age. I heard that you once, you've got to authenticate this tall tale for me, because I've heard that once you came first, second and third in a poetry competition. Is that true? Yeah. Well, I was the judge as well. So no, I, didn't. No, I wasn't. I wasn't the judge. I, I'd like to think that that's true. Yeah, why not? Let it be true. <laughs> That's how I started out. I thought I won a poetry competition. That kind of started my whole career out, really. Oh, yeah? Did yeah. you used to do the... Uh, I used to do Saturday Night Live with all the angry young men poems, you know, sort of punk poet and that. Uh, well, I'm not a till of the stockbroker. No, I, a till of the stockbroker, Stephen Wells, myself. Stephen Wells, yeah. Who yeah. was who was seething Wells at the time, myself, yeah. John Cooper Clark. Listen, you're a big fan of William Blake, aren't you? Yeah, I am drawn to him. I was fascinated by the fact that they... You know Blake House in Soho? Yeah. It's one of the last like residential council blocks in the West End, where it was. When I used to stand outside at the door and just trying to imagine what William Blake would have thought of tower blocks. But yeah, you can really feel it. That's one thing I do miss about London is that those strange walks through the dawn, you know, trying to summon the spirits of old England. And What are your memories of London like? I mean, I suppose yeah, it has I a very I mixed feelings for you now. Yeah. Yeah, but I suppose memories, even the word, it just shoots you straight back to early childhood where I was, we moved around a lot, but the anchors was always where mum and dad were from. So my mum was in Liverpool, my dad was in London. Basically, as soon as I could, I just wanted to live in London from an early age. And wherever we went around the world, I'd just lie and say that that's where I was from and that's where I'd lived before. But until um, I left home, I couldn't really live anywhere permanently. So, but the first thing I did was I went to live with my nan in Dollis Hill. I got a job at Wilsdon Cemetery. What, a grave digger? Well, the machine dug them, but we used to fill them in. I can remember reading William Blake for the first time on my lunch break under the tree at the cemetery. No, I do miss, I do miss London. How hard was it to get clean, Pete? It's, um, it's not just that it was hard, it is hard, I think, you know, to keep on the straight and narrow. Every, it, it does, the obsession starts to lift a little bit. Yeah, because I've read uh, that you can't keep it from me forever. That's kind of like a white knuckle ride for uh, when you're coming uh, off drugs, yeah, is that yeah, true? Yeah, that, that's different because when I wrote those words, I really was white knuckling. I don't feel like at the moment I'm white knuckling, but definitely those, that first part of lockdown, mm. when Fred was coming down here and it was just, like, just me and him across the table, probably the six month period, you know? So now I sing it and it's not really, you know, thinking about drugs in my mind, but definitely at the time it was like, yeah, no, it's just a matter of time. I'll get back to it and I'll be happy to. But now I'm quite glad I held on for a bit, you know. That feeling that you're just going to always want it and never be able to live without it, you know, that's the killer. Listen, let's talk about the Libertines. We know that there's some new Libertines material on the horizon. And you've been working with The Prodigy, haven't you? Yeah, we've been really busy. We've been really busy. Um... The last tour we did, which was uh, finished around Christmas time, mm -hmm. just gone. So where are we now? 2022. So yeah, Christmas 2021. We finished the tour on a real high, like feeling really together and uh, like it was a good time for us to be writing new stuff. And so on the, on the bus as well, and when we were rehearsing, there's loads of new ideas bouncing around. I think we're going to be uh, getting together for a week and try and get a few of these new ideas out there. Mustang was one of them, mm -hmm. one of the songs we were working on. Are we talking like the Libertines going a bit sort of electronic? I don't know. I think, to be honest, it was the other way around. I think it was more a case of the lad from the prodigy wanted to make a bit of noise with the real drums and the, the real guitars. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, would you if I say someone like Jamie T, would, would you describe him as electronic? Because I think Carl's done a track with him mm -hmm. where he's doing more, not, we wouldn't call it rappy stuff, but try, Carl wants his Basingstoke accent <laughs> to, to come out more because right? he's sick of people thinking he's posh, but um, <laughs> I'm not. I'm from an estate in Basingstoke, so he's, he's, he's doing a lot more. more What's your that. relationship with Carl like now? Because it has been fractious over the years, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, no, I think like uh, long-standing mates that you've got who would be probably classed as brothers hmm. as much as friends. Yeah, there's times when you've been at each other's throats. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, no, it's definitely, shall we say, settled down. It's true. We got back to do Red Dwarf. Uh, it came out during the first lockdown. 
I mean, you know, you miss the guys and all that. And then um, after five months filming, <laughs> you realise why you, you never want to see them again. But, yeah. that, but then that all wears off and you, and you start to miss them again, you know? Yeah, no, it's exactly it's exactly like that. And he's got his two kids and his missus now and he's settled down. I've definitely calmed down a little bit. And I think really that's the be all and end all of it for him is that while I was doing what I was doing, he didn't want to be around me and didn't want to be watching that. So it's all love and smiles, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, mate, I don't want to speak too soon. That's what I mean. All right, and one authentication of a tall tale, Pete. Is it true that you like to take typewriters apart and put them back together again? Yes. Yeah, that's not such a tall tale, is it? Is that is that is that ever so strange? Well, I, I was just don't thinking. We all, don't we all? Isn't that isn't that every man's dream? I was just thinking, as hobbies go, what's wrong with fishing? <laughs> <laughs> Lee Mathers was once asked what he thought about me after he met, and he said he's he's a nice bloke, but I wouldn't want to go fishing with him. Yeah. <laughs> I never understood it, to be honest. I thought maybe because I was a bit manic at the time, I don't know. <laughs> Listen, mate, it's been fantastic talking to you. 